This video is an extract from my course Foundations of Functional Programming in Scala. If you like my content, you can find more functional programming videos at fptower.com. Enjoy! Hi everyone! Functions are the centerpiece of functional programming. It's important we have a strong understanding of how they work in Scala before we can move on to more powerful concepts. So today we're going to concentrate on the difference between val and def functions. Here I created a function called replicate using both a val and def syntax. Replicate takes two arguments, an int and a string, and it returns a new string by basically copying over the input text as many times as it is specified. So if we call replicate with hello and three, we get back hello three times. As you can see, the way we define replicate is quite different for these two syntaxes. But the usage is exactly the same. We always specify the name of the function, and then we pass the arguments between parentheses. There is no difference whatsoever. That's why you can use Scala for years without noticing that there are actually two different kinds of functions. Scala tries very hard to hide the difference between val and def functions. However, val functions are crucial to so many functional programming techniques, such as higher order functions and partial function applications. So if we want to understand these notions, we first need to learn how val functions work. Here we define a val function by first writing the expected inputs between parentheses. Then we have an arrow, and finally the body of the function. So here we can see why val functions are also called lambdas, or anonymous functions, because the object we created doesn't have a name. It's just an anonymous object. In a sense, it's exactly the same as an int or a string or an instance of a case class. To give it a name, we need to use a standard value syntax. For example, we'll say val replicate equals or anonymous function, val counter equals three, or val message equals hello world. Similarly, if we wanted to give replicate another name, such as repeat, we would do it in exactly the same way we would alias an int. We would say val repeat equals replicate, meaning that both repeat and replicate share the same object, which is the anonymous function we previously defined. So finally, to drive the point home that functions are ordinary objects, let's have a look at data structures. In many programming languages, we cannot have a data structure of functions, because in those languages, functions are not data. It's not something we can store in a variable. However, in Scala, we don't have this limitation, as we can see it here. I created a list containing three functions so that we can look them up by indices. If we say, for example, function 0, 10, then we look up the first item in the list and we apply 10 to it, which gives us 11 because the first function increments the input by one. But if we say functions to 10, then this time the result is 20 because the last function in the list multiplies the input by two. So we've seen that as far as the Scala compiler is concerned, a val function is no different from any other object in the language. However, if we look at the syntax of a val function, it doesn't look ordinary at all. For example, if we look at the type of replicate, we say int string arrow string. You're probably thinking, this doesn't look like a normal type, nor does the body of the function. And you'd be right. The Scala parser includes some specific code dedicated to val functions to make them nicer to use. It's like a DSL, a domain specific language that makes val functions more user friendly. However, we can choose not to use this DSL as an exercise to better our understanding of how the Scala compiler represents val functions under the hood. So let's start by expanding the type of replicate. It's in fact called function to int string string because replicate takes two arguments, an int and a string, and it returns a new string. The Scala language has 23 different kinds of functions from function zero that takes no input, it's like a lazy value, to function 22 that takes 22 inputs. As a side note, we cannot have more than 22 arguments with a val function in Scala, 
it's not really a strict limitation because we, we generally don't need that much. But the good thing is, in Dotty or Scala 3, this limitation has been lifted. So we'll soon be able to create functions with as many arguments as we want. Now let's have a look at the right hand side of this expression, where we create the function object. It turns out that it's equivalent to an anonymous instance of the function2 type. And function2 is a trait which has only one unimplemented or abstract method. On the JVM, this particular kind of interface has a name. It's called a SAM type, which stands for single abstract method. And whenever we have a SAM type, we can use this concise function syntax. For example, if we define a trait printer with a single abstract method print, then when we create an instance of printer, we can either use the standard object creation syntax, like new printer, or we can use a SAM syntax, message arrow println. So now if we come back to replicate, it starts to make sense why var functions are defined this way. The code you see on the screen is just a SAM syntax for function2. And we can use it because function2 has only one abstract method, apply. Now one mystery remains. Why can we call replicate without specifying apply? For example, we can say replicate3 hello, and it's equivalent to replicate.apply3 hello. Again, the Scala compiler has some specific parsing logic for this. Whenever we have something dot apply, we can always remove the dot apply part. For instance, in printer, if we rename the print method apply, and we create an instance called console, then we can say console hello world, and it will call the apply method of printer automatically. This can be quite convenient when we want to create a concise DSL for a domain, but at the same time, we have to be careful not to overuse it as it can make our code less readable. OK, so now we have a strong understanding of val functions. We have seen that they are anonymous objects, and that under the hood, a val function is nothing more than a trait with a single abstract method. In other words, a val function is a method packaged inside an object. Now let's have a look at def functions or methods. Def functions are the most idiomatic way to create functions in Scala. Here, for example, we have create date. It's a method that takes three int, a year, a month, and a day of the month, and it returns a Java time local date, something that represents a calendar date, such as the 5th of January 2020. One important characteristic of def functions is that everything's come packaged together. The name of the function, the name of its arguments and their types, the output type, and the body of the function. This is quite different from val functions, where the name of the arguments are defined within the body of the function, which, if you think about it, it's quite annoying when you have several inputs of the same type, as with create date. In a case like that, we would prefer to see the arguments' names in the function signature, so that we know which order they go in. These points become particularly clear when we look at the other parts of the tooling, such as IDEs or the Scala doc. When we start typing create date on our IDE, we'll get two proposals, one for the def function and one for the val function. And as we can see, the def function is much more informative. We have access to the name of the arguments, which means that most likely we'll use create date correctly. However, for the val function, we only know it takes a triple of int, and basically we have to figure it out how to order the year, the month, and the day. Another benefit of the compiler knowing the names of the inputs is that we can call a def function using either the position of the arguments or their names. For example, here we call create date by first specifying the day of the month, even though it is the third argument of create date. As long as we name the argument, we can use it in any position. And it's particularly convenient when a method takes several inputs of the same type, or if we use a non-informative type like Boolean, as it helps to give some context to the expected input. However, one thing to remember about def function 
is that they are not data. They're not values like val functions. So we cannot put them inside a data structure or assign them to a variable. Here, if we try to do so, we'll get a compile time error. But if we look at the error message, we see something quite interesting. It tells us that actually what we tried could have worked if we had added an underscore after the method's name. In Scala, underscore means different things in different contexts. Here the underscore means, please Scala compiler, could you transform this def function into a val function? And the proper name for this pattern is a eta expansion. But to be honest, it's just a fancy name for a conversion from a def function to a val function. Nothing more. Another way to demonstrate this eta expansion is when we try to assign a def function into a val. In this case, we would again need to add an underscore to make it work. One thing that makes this underscore quite annoying is the fact that in most cases, it's not required. Here we only needed it because the Scala compiler didn't know what to expect. It didn't know what we wanted to do. But we can help the compiler a little bit by adding a type annotation to this expression. For example, if we say that we're expecting a list of type triple int to local date, then this time the compiler will be able to transform our method into a val function automatically without an underscore. And in practice, we often use val function as an anonymous function inside of a larger computation. And in that case, we know the expected type, which means that most of the time we can convert a def function into a val function without any additional syntax or even noticing that there was a conversion. To summarize, today we have looked at the difference between val and def functions. In a perfect world, we'd only have one kind of function. Yet we have seen that these two concepts each have their advantages. A, a val function is a fantastic tool because it's just an ordinary object. So we can use it in any location where we would use an int or a string. Yet it doesn't provide the same kind of information to the compiler or to the rest of the tool chain as a def function. That's why I would recommend using a def function for a top level API or even by default. And the good thing is, if at any point we need to transform a def function into a val function, this can be done very easily by using the underscore syntax. And in most cases, it's done by the compiler automatically anyway. In the next lecture, we're going to discuss another advantage of val functions being an ordinary object, one that can enable a very powerful technique in functional programming. So stay tuned. Don't forget to check out my website, fp-tower.com, to get access to all my functional programming content and sign up for my course. See you soon.